Hi, I'm Professor Laser. Welcome to Learn Innovation Law. I got a really good response to my last video in the 3D printing space, but I got a lot of questions about prior art and what constitutes prior art for a patent case. So in this video, I'm going to tell you about patent prior art and the novelty and obviousness requirements in patent law. But the statute that addresses whether something is prior art for a patent is a little bit complicated. And what complicates it even further is that there's two versions of this statute that might apply depending on what date the patent was filed. So if you have a patent that was filed prior to March 16th, 2013, that patent is going to be addressed under what's called the pre-AIA or before the America Invents Act version of this statute. That is much more complicated and difficult to follow. So I'm going to start first with patents that are filed on or after March 16th, 2013. Those ones are going to follow the new version of the novelty statute that is what I'm going to call post-AIA or post-America Invents Act. So I know this looks really complicated, but it's a lot less complicated than the statute itself. So this is the post-AIA regime. It's 35 U.S.C. Section 102A and B. And this statute walks through for those patents filed after that critical date, how do you determine what is prior art? So to start with, you look at if something is patented, described in a printed publication, this could be a journal article or any other kind of publication that fully describes how to make and use the patented invention in a way that's understandable to a person having skill in that art form, if it was in public use, or if it was on sale or otherwise available to the public before the effective filing date of the claimed invention, that's going to be something that could be prior art. Another alternative situation where you could have prior art is if the invention was described in a patent or patent application filed by somebody else before you filed your application. However, there are a number of exceptions to the prior art rules. So if you have a disclosure, for example, in an article or in some other kind of written documentation, like a manual written and disclosed by the inventor of the patent at issue, that's not going to qualify as prior art in the United States if it occurred one year or less before the filing date of that patent. Similarly, if, for example, the inventor had disclosed the information in a journal article and then somebody else ran out and tried to patent it, that's also not going to be prior art to the patent because we assume that that person obtained the information from the patentee if the patentee had published that information first and within the grace period. So basically, in the post-AIA version of the statute, you have critically things that happen more than one year before the effective filing date or things that are published by other people beyond the inventor that are something documented, something like a patent, a printed publication, a manual, or it could be, in the case of a sale, a secret sale. And that's based on the interpretation of the previous statute that they wanted to keep consistent. So we'll take a look at that statute next. This one is more complicated, so I'm going to break it up into a few parts. If we have a patent that was filed before March 16th, 2013, we're going to be applying the pre-AIA version of the statute. It's sometimes also called the 1952 Act. Under the pre-AIA version, of section 102A, a person shall be entitled to a patent unless, and this is one of the ways you can invalidate a patent, if you have prior art showing that the invention was known or used by others in this country, meaning in the United States. Alternatively, if it was patented or described in a printed publication anywhere, whether here or in a foreign country. And interestingly, this publication doesn't have to be a really official journal article. Some courts have found that even somebody's thesis buried in a library somewhere in a foreign country could still be a printed publication for purposes of the prior art 
novelty requirement under Section 102. This is true both for the pre-AIA and post-AIA versions of the statute. These activities under pre-AIA follow what's called first to invent, meaning that instead of looking at the filing date, we're looking to see whether these activities happened before the invention by the applicant. What does it mean to happen before the invention? It means before the person conceived of the idea for the patent. Now, there are some additional rules that in order to actually benefit from that earlier conception date, you have to have a certain amount of diligence or reducing the invention to practice. Needless to say, this could be complicated and consult an attorney if you really have questions on this. So the pre-AIA version of the statute has this novelty section, but it also has a period that relates to filing as well. So something can also be prior art under the statutory bar, we bar section 102B, if the invention was in public use or on sale in this country or patented or described in a printed publication anywhere more than a year prior to the date of filing the application for the patent. So this is pretty similar to the kind of grace period that we see in the post-AIA world. But in this instance, it's kind of like an alternative to the first to invent system. It's saying that, look, even if you were first to invent, you're not going to be entitled to patent if you started disclosing it in printed publications more than a year before you filed. If you have two people that are fighting to say that they have ownership of a patent because they filed around the same time, in this pre-AIA world, you're going to do this kind of timeline of who came up with the idea first, were they diligent in coming up with the idea before they reduced it to practice, a pretty complicated determination that, again, should be assisted by an attorney. Another thing to keep in mind is that for something to qualify as invalidating prior art under the novelty section of the Patent Act, it needs to match all of the claimed limitations. So if you have a patent claim that has three different elements listed, like a heated bed with a polymer coating and some other additional element, the prior art, in order to invalidate under the novelty standard, must also contain all three of those elements. Now, if you want to invalidate under a different part of the statute, like obviousness, you could do that too, without the prior art actually containing all of the elements that are present in the claimed invention. The way you would do this is you would say, for example, that the prior art contains elements A and B, but that element C, which is in the patent and not in the prior art, is something that would be obvious to a person of skill in the art at the time of the invention to include in the invention. There's all kinds of interesting sub-factors for trying to determine whether something would be obvious to a person of skill in the art. And you look at complex economic factors, what are called secondary indicia of non-obviousness. But for this video, I'm going to focus on prior art that satisfies the novelty standard. And in order to invalidate under novelty, the prior art needs to have every claim element that is present in the patent. How does a patent lawyer try to figure out where the prior art is located? Where do they start? So typically this would begin with a search of references that are available to that lawyer. So things that were perhaps cited in the patent application or in the back and forth with the patent examiner. This can be a little bit harder to use as prior art because it was before the patent examiner. And so theoretically, if it granted the patent with that information before them, then the patent examiner would have thought that that information did not upset whether this was going to be a valid patent or not. The other place that lawyers can look for prior art is by trying to gather data from the other side in discovery to figure out if there are prior sales or prior publications of the material that was then patented. The common way that somebody is going to not be eligible for a patent is because one of their scientists went to a conference and published a paper on the topic more than a year before they decided to tell their attorneys at the company to go file a patent. Another common way that people have problems is if them or a competitor sold a product before they got the chance to file that patent. So this is something that's much more common under the current version of the novelty statute 
and was a little bit less common under the old version of the novelty statute that looked at who was first to invent. But now we're in the first to file system, and you can sometimes end up with invalidating prior art from sales by that company or another company before the filing date and outside the grace period. So another place that lawyers will look for prior art is by trying to hire a prior art company. So there are prior art search companies that will go and hunt down patents, publications, and even old manuals that have information that could be used to map those publications or manuals onto the patent claims. And typically, lawyers would pay a fee of something like $3,000 to $20,000 to conduct the search, depending on how detailed it is and how many patents are going to be part of that process. Another way that lawyers sometimes try to find prior art is by using a company that will post a bounty for finding and validating prior art. And this is where people that are really knowledgeable about a specific field can generate some income from their knowledge of old devices. So if you find a page that's posting a bounty and you discover that you have a manual in your basement that shows that all of those elements of the patent claim are present in a product that was sold more than a year before the filing date of that patent or before the invention of the patent, depending on which statute you're under, then you can tell the attorney, hey, I have this piece of prior art that could be invalidating. They'll look at it. And if it ends up being used to invalidate the patent, then you get a payout for being the one to identify and provide that piece of prior art. The key to this is don't share the prior art until you get an agreement that you're going to get compensated for sharing the prior art. You don't want to just email this to the lawyer, in which case they'll say, gee, thanks. All right, I'll use this. You'll want to either respond to a bounty post or you can email the lawyer and say, I'd like this amount of money. I have a piece of prior art from this state that contains these elements listed in this way. And I'd like to provide it to you with a bounty agreement that says that if it's successfully used to invalidate the patent, that I'm going to get paid typically $5,000 or something in that range for something that actually invalidates the patent. How would you map a piece of prior art onto a patent claim to figure out whether the prior art renders that patent invalid for lack of novelty? You would do what's called a claim chart typically, and you would take all of the elements of the patent claim every line, every word of the patent claim, you would dissect it and you would figure out what does that claim term mean? What is actually covered by this patent? To figure that out, you sometimes have to look at the context of the patent, at definitions provided in the patent, and sometimes also by looking at contemporaneous dictionaries and other sources that might tell you how somebody of skill in the art at the time of the patent would have interpreted those words or understood the contents of the patent claim. Once you figure out the meaning of the claim terms, you then make sure that the prior art contains each of those elements. For example, if one element is a heated bed, the prior art needs to have a heated bed. If one element is a polymer coating, the prior art needs to have a polymer coating. If an element is something more nuanced that might be hard to interpret, for example, sometimes patent claims will reference specific temperature ranges or dosing or a certain mixture of compounds. Then the prior art would need to fall within the scope of that range in order to be invalidating under the novelty standard. This can be really difficult to assess without the help of a lawyer and without the help of expert witnesses who understand what someone of skill in the art at the time the patent was filed would have thought when they were reading that patent claim. One thing that I tell my students as a handy tip to figure out whether something constitutes prior art and whether it maps onto the patent claims is that what is invalidating under novelty before the patent is issued would be infringing if after the patent. You use the same standard, looking at the map of the patent claims and the elements of the patent in order to figure out whether it maps onto that prior art reference. Sometimes a company will sue somebody else on a patent that they didn't actually invent. This is possible because people can buy and sell patent rights. So if a company buys a patent from another company, 
that can mean that sometimes that company can bring a lawsuit to sue, even though there was another company that had that product on the marketplace. Why? Because maybe the person who filed the patent or the company that filed the patent did so within the grace period. And so if that disclosure that would have otherwise been invalidating falls within the grace period, that one year before filing, and let's say it was a product sale by the company that files for the patent, and then somebody else buys that, they're entitled to the grace period that's inherited from that person they bought it from. The validity is going to be based on whether the inventor is the one who had published or disclosed that information within the grace period. Some people have asked, well, what if a company buys a patent and then decides not to enforce it for a while? Should that render the patent invalid? Are they allowed to simply choose one person that they're going to sue or one company that they're going to bring a lawsuit against and ignore the rest of the marketplace? Yes. This is very different from trademark law, where failing to enforce your rights can result in invalidity of those rights in some circumstances. The patent context is very different, and the reasons why we have a patent is different from the reason why we have trademark. With the patent right, this is something where there's a disclosure to the public of how to make and use the invention in the patent application, and in return, you get these exclusive rights to make, use, sell, import and all of the other rights that you get under a patent. That right can be bought and sold to others, and you don't have to bring a lawsuit against others to continue to enforce your right. You already paid the price when you either disclosed that information to the public in your patent filing, or you paid the purchase price to the person who made that disclosure. We're not concerned in the patent context with somebody failing to enforce their rights. That will not result in invalidity like it would potentially in something like a trademark environment. So what happens if there is prior art to a patent? Well, that patent can get invalidated in court. That patent can be invalidated through proceedings at the patent office. It could also be found invalid in other proceedings, like proceedings before the U.S. International Trade Commission. There's a lot of places that have jurisdiction to decide the validity of a patent. However, only the United States Patent and Trademark Office has the ability to cancel a patent and to decide that it never should have issued in the first place. Thanks for listening. I hope that this discussion of prior art was useful for you. Again, my name is Krista Laser. I am a professor, and I came to be a professor after spending nearly a decade practicing intellectual property litigation at some of the highest ranked firms in the country please let me know in the comments if you have any other questions about how prior art works so that I can answer it in another video. Since I'm pretty new to YouTube, please like and subscribe 